The topic that our beloved Anne-Marie sent was to speak about the, the spiritual essence of India. And the importance of our of satsang. The first piece about the spiritual essence of India is that you have to do it, you have to absorb it, get it, learn it, experience it, exactly the way you're doing it. Most of us have traveled in many parts of the world, and if you go to Europe, let's say, even if you go to America, so many other countries in the world, you can see that country, experience that country through going to museums, through going to see the sites, through sitting in a cafe and enjoying the scenery. You can have sort of a checklist of sites you have to see, monuments you have to see, restaurants you have to eat in, places you have to go to. And you can do that and you've really seen the city. But in India it's actually not like that. And too many people come to India with the checklist of Taj Mahal, this, that, you know, have to see this, have to see that, half a day here, half a day there. And what India has to offer is actually not in those buildings. Yeah, the buildings are great. But I've been in India 21 years. I've never seen the Taj Mahal. <laughs> and that's not because it's not beautiful. It's because what I've gotten from India has been so deep and so transformative that the idea of picking up from where I am and going to see a monument would never occur to me unless I were given some technique of you know, parallel lives. If I could simultaneously be on the banks of Ganga and seeing the Taj Mahal, then maybe I'd consider it. But if I actually had to leave the banks of Ganga to go there, it's just never, never been worth it. India is a country that you learn about and experience by letting it inside. India is going to get inside you. <laughs> I promise. What most of us try to do is prevent that. And as I always say, trying to prevent India from getting inside you is sort of the equivalent of holding up a stop sign at a tsunami. <laughs> the tsunami doesn't care. You and the stop sign are going to get wet anyway. You're going to drown anyway. So India is going to get inside you. The part that's up to you. is how you're going to let India give you what it has to offer. And it's not going to be easy. India does not give you an experience the way sitting in a cafe on the Champs-Élysées on the banks of the Seine and drinking cappuccino gives you an experience. That's also nice. I'm not saying that's nice. It's just a completely different experience. India's not always going to be fun. It's going to take you, or who you thought you were, pull you up from the inside, shove you in your face. <laughs> That's what India is going to do. But at that moment, you've got two options. One option is to say, this seems like a really scary tsunami. I feel like I'm drowning. I'm going to die. Therefore, I'm going to turn around and run in the other direction. It's one way to do it. But then, of course, the question is, why didn't you go to Paris to begin with? 
The other way to do it is to say, this tsunami is a tsunami in which I have faith. Because this is the tsunami of spiritual experience, spiritual awakening. And the only way to allow it to transform you is to allow yourself to get swept up into it. And so when you find yourself face to face with you, keep your eyes open. Because as you look at that part of you or those parts of you that you would really rather not look at, the parts of you that you thought were so nicely wrapped and packed and packaged and tucked away that most of us tend to drink away or eat away or shop away or have sex away or gamble away or whatever our particular or Facebook away, whatever our chosen method of distraction may be. India's not going to let you do that. And so when that's right up in your face, keep your eyes open. Because what you're going to find is that that which you've been running from, that which you thought was dark, that which you thought was scary, actually isn't. It's just because you've been turning your back on it. Just before we came, we were sitting with Anand having tea with Tommy and Kia, and Tommy asked him, we were talking about the wild animals, and Tommy asked him, well, so if you did see a tiger, what would be the appropriate reaction? Like, what does one do if one encounters a tiger? And Anand said, well, whatever you do, don't turn your back on it. Because to wild animals, that's the signal to give chase. And interestingly enough, that's the exact same truth about that which feels dark and scary and wild inside ourselves. It's only dangerous when we turn our backs on it. So I just want to begin by saying India's going to get inside. It's going to show you yourself. But here's, here's the exciting part, because there's actually two aspects of you, or there's more than two aspects, of course, but let's call it two for the moment. There's the aspect of you that has a meltdown. The aspect of you that when that stuff comes up, when you're triggered, and it's going to be simple. It's going to be something simple. It's going to be somebody saying they're going to do something that they don't do. It's going to be the faucet that won't stop leaking, or the toilet that doesn't flush right, or the person next to you in yoga, or whatever. It's going to be, it's going to be something really simple and superficial. And you're going to start to feel like you're having a meltdown. And that's one part of you. But then what you're going to find is, if you stay true to it, if you don't turn your back and run from that, is that 30 seconds later, you're in ecstasy like you never imagined possible. And this is what India does that is so incredible, is it brings up the light and the dark of us like this. You're ir irate that the plumber can't fix your sink. I mean, just, just beyond irate. And then suddenly you're experiencing a oneness with the entire universe that you never dreamed possible. And then the next moment, you're irate because they forgot to make the gluten-free chapati. And what are you going to eat? And you're starving, and you've done so much yoga, and you need to have food, but if you have, you know. And then, and then 30 seconds later, you're merging into oneness with the person next to you in line for food or with the person serving your food or with the food itself. 
And so the most crucial piece is allow it all to happen. That's why you're here. That's why you're not in Paris at this moment. And if you choose, when you go back, you can always go back to the way you were before. We've got free will. But at least for while you're here, allow India to give you what India has to give you. Don't try to do India the way that you do Europe, the way that you do America, because it won't be done and you'll just be frustrated. On the level of the actual teachings, the level of the actual, what is this spiritual essence, let's, let's take some different, some different pieces and we'll get through as many as we have time for. The, the first piece I think that is really the most important compared to the West is that at the core of who you are, you are divine. This is one of the most basic, fundamental tenets of Indian spiritual tradition because this is a dilemma. You look at the Hindu tradition and you say to 10 different Hindus, okay, so what's the spiritual essence of Hinduism? What is Hinduism about? And you're gonna get 10 entirely different answers and they're all gonna be right. So in sharing, in sharing this with you, I wanna get get beneath the different paths and the different lineages to really that which is, is core. And I think at the root of what the Indian spiritual tradition has to offer people, from every religion, from every culture, people for whom it's not about changing religion, it's not about becoming this or becoming that, it's just about being touched. And that's the incredible gift that the teachings have is they're not about religion. I mean, there is no place in the Indian scriptures that the word Hindu arises. They don't call themselves Hindus. Hindu is, is a poor pronunciation of Sindhu, which is the river that runs through what used to be the Indus Valley civilization. So the people on the banks of that river were the people who were referred to as the Hindus. So it's not, it's not about your religion or your culture or your language or anything like that. So that's another really important point to just clarify in the very beginning, is these teachings are what are referred to as sanatan dharm, an eternal way of life. And for something to be eternal, it has to be equally applicable to people of every culture, of every religion, of every language, of every part of the world. So number one, who you are at the core is divine. The Judeo-Christian tradition tends to give us the opposite, which is at the core of who you are, there is something wrong with you. Some of us get it in religion, original sin, the simple fact that you took birth has filled you with this sin. Here are the practices you can do to attain salvation, which literally means being saved. Being saved from what? From the repercussions if you don't perform these things and you don't attain salvations, which is that result of your sin, which you didn't do anything for. It's just, it's the core of who you are. And those of us who didn't get it religiously, we got it culturally. We got it in a culture that tells us, you're not right. You're not enough. You're not smart enough. You're not thin enough. You're not pretty enough or handsome enough. You're not rich enough. 
This is, this is what our culture is rooted on. And those of us from that culture, this is really how we grow up living. We get praised for things we do. You bring home an A on the exam, mom's happy, dad's happy, you're the star of the class, you're, you're smart, you're the good one. You don't bring home an A on the exam. And it's not just that you didn't do well, it's that there's something wrong with the core of who you are. You're not good enough. And in the Indian spiritual tradition, it's the exact opposite. The core of who you are is divine and perfect. Absolutely perfect. And the reason that we know that is you've been created not just by the divine, but of the divine. There's a, a beautiful mantra that says, Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamadachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva, Vishishate. And what it means is that, the capital T, that, the divine that, whatever name, form, concept we have for the divine, it doesn't matter. But that, is whole and complete, perfect, divine. And this, which has been removed from that, created out of that, is also whole and perfect and divine and complete. It's, it's the spiritual equivalent of the mathematic principle that tells us infinity minus 10 is what? Right? Infinity. Infinity divided by 100 is what? Infinity. Infinity divided by 7 billion is what? Still infinity. So the mantra tells us the same thing that math tells us. You take something that's infinite, create as much as you want out of it, well, all of those are also infinite. So the core of who you are is divine. Doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. Doesn't mean we don't do things for which we have to reap the karma, or the fruits of the karma, and we suffer. But that's due to ignorance. That's due to forgetting that I'm divine. See, if, I've, if I forget that at the core, that I'm already full. Well, then I need things. I need to shop more, I need to buy more, I need to eat more, I need to be more beautiful, I need to be smarter. I need to have the right spouse or the right children or the right friends or vacation in the right place because those are the things that will make me enough. Then I'll feel like I'm complete. And so when I live like that, It's never enough, as we all know. As long as that happiness is going to come to me from something outside, then I'm always an arm's length away from it. Then it's always one thing more I need. And whether it's something material, whether it's a degree, whether it's to lose 10 pounds, whether it's for somebody to love me enough, I'm always feeling empty. And when I'm feeling empty, I identify as the only thing I can find, which is my body. And so this is now who I am. And I take all of my cues of identity from people around me. And in that case, well, if I don't have enough money for the brace that I want, I'm going to steal it. When I steal it, I find myself fined or thrown in jail, suffering. But the suffering is not due to the fact that I'm sinful. Stealing wasn't a sin. It was a pathetic attempt to restore wholeness to a place where wholeness always was, but where I had forgotten there was wholeness. So I had gone out in ignorance to grab something, and I'm suffering the bitter fruits of that 
karma. So this is how the Indian philosophy goes, is at the core, pure, perfect, divine, complete, that which we do, which you would call sins, which our religions would tell us are sins, things that are done out of greed or lust or ego or anger, are done only because of ignorance. Because I have ignored, right? What's ignorance? It's not that I'm stupid. Ignorance is not stupidity. Ignorance is I have ignored the truth. And when I ignore the truth, I suffer. My academic background is psychology, and one of my most famous, well, not my most famous, one of the most famous, my most favorite uh, studies of psychology is a study where they took students and they gave them an experiment. And the experiment was they had to watch a six-minute basketball game. And they had to count how many baskets each team made. And there was a white team and there was a red team. And counting baskets is easy, right? I mean, you watch six minutes. Most of us can pay attention for six minutes. And at the end of the game, they were all given a questionnaire. And on the questionnaire, there were three questions. How many baskets did the white team make? Number two, how many baskets did the red team make? Almost everybody got both of those questions exactly right. It was not like a super high-speed, fast-moving game. It was just a regular game. You can see the red guys are making a basket. The white guys are making a basket. So they got those mostly right. The third question was, and did you notice anything else? More than 50% of the people said no. Now, it turns out, and this was really what the study was, halfway through the basketball game, an, a giant gorilla, a person, but in a gorilla costume, came onto the center of the basketball field and started to dance. Center camera for 30 seconds. Occupied the center of the camera, dancing. More than 50% of the people missed it. Now, clearly they were paying attention. They got the baskets right. Clearly their eyes were open. They were students, college students, graduate students. These are always the people in these experiments. So what happened? And what they realized happened was, and this is what they wanted to study, this is what they were studying, was attention and focus. If we are not told to pay attention to something, and we're told to pay attention to something else, well, we're very good at following instructions, especially those of us who are college students, graduate school students, were great at following orders. Do this many pages, do this, do that, do this. And the instructions they were given were, count the baskets. If anybody had said, oh, and by the way, in the middle of this game, be sure to keep your eyes open because there's going to be a surprise, or make sure you see the gorilla, they would have seen it. But it wasn't what they were told to look for. And so they missed it. And so the ignorance that we speak about, this ignoring, is the ignoring of who we are. And the reason we ignore it is it's not what we were told to do. When we are being raised, what we're told is get a good education. Get a good job. Make a lot of money. Build a big house. Have a big family. Put your kids in private school. Wear nice clothes. Look the right way. Here's what your hair should look like. Here's what your body should look like. Here's what your car should look like. Here's what your children should look like. And nobody says to us, 
But be sure to keep your eyes open because actually this isn't what it's about. Actually, this isn't the point. Nobody tells us that, sadly. And so we go through our lives metaphorically counting baskets. We're being very obedient. We're doing exactly what we were told. We get our degrees. We get our jobs. We have our families. And then at some point in our lives, too tragically, it's toward the end, we say, wait, is that all there was? Did I miss something? And so the, the spiritual essence of India is really focused on this isn't what it's about. Sure, do it by all means. By all means, do it. Enjoy. Enjoy the world. God has created the world for you. Enjoy it all. But do not think that this is actually what it's about. And if you keep your eyes open, you'll see it. Another aspect, which is one of my favorite to share, particularly with groups who are new to India, is the opportunity that India gives us to literally rewrite how we view, value our days. Most of us do it on the basis of time. Okay? How much time I have, what I can do here, what I have at this time. We all have schedules. So in India, you may have noticed, nothing happens on time. <laughs> it's just, it's part of the culture. They're not purposely late, it just, Everybody means very well, it's just things don't happen on time. And usually what happens for those of us who have come from abroad is punctuality is seen as a sign of respect abroad. If you and I are going to meet for tea and we've decided to meet for tea at 5 and I'm there at 5 and you don't show up until 5.30, well to me that's an insult to me. It means you don't value me as a person. This is our, most of our Western culture. And so when in India we come and somebody says to us, I'll meet you at 5, and they show up at 7. <laughs> yeah, it's never like 5.05. <laughs> they have no awareness of why you're so angry. I mean, you're livid. Like, you're, you're, you're red, you're sweaty. And in many cases, they, they really don't get it. And their, their answer very frequently, most of the time, is, well, but I'm here. Like, I'm here now, so, so I don't understand why you're mad. Okay, maybe you were mad 10 minutes ago when I wasn't here, but now I'm here, so now, now what's the issue? I'm here. And, and this is a real, a real cultural issue. And I'm someone from a family where I grew up in a home where if my dad said he was going to be home from work at 7, by quarter to 7, he was already late. I mean, quarter to 7, my mom was looking out the window, where is he? So you come to India, and you think, my God. A little while into being here, a few weeks or a few months, I learned something incredible. The... Hindi alphabet, the Devanagari script, has 52 letters compared to our English 26, which for anybody who happens to be a mathematician could tell us how many more possible permutations there are. Um, I don't remember the equation. I remember it had an exclamation point in it. But there is, there is an equation for figuring out how many thousands or millions more possible permutations there are of words. Water has many, many, many different words for water. There's many different ways of saying water, and they tend to vary based on things like it's holy water versus it's dirty water, it's flowing water, it's still water, and all of these 
Very, very subtle distinctions. The exact same word, exact same spelling, exact same pronunciation means yesterday and tomorrow. This is true, this is not a joke. <laughs> the word is kal, and it means tomorrow, and it also means yesterday. And the only way in speaking Hindi that you know whether somebody means yesterday or tomorrow, and if you speak to Indian people whose English is not fluent, Long enough, you'll hear them make that mistake. They'll say something like, oh, great, I'll see you at 10 o'clock yesterday. Or um, tomorrow when we were having lunch, and it takes a moment and you realize, oh, wait, that's because for them it's the same word. And the only way that you know which one they mean is due to the conjugation of the verb. Verb is in the present tense. I mean, the verb is in the future tense. They mean the one tomorrow. Verb is in the past tense, they mean the one yesterday. So here's what that taught me, which gets at spiritual essence. It's much more than just nobody's ever going to show up on time. The sooner you accept it, the happier you are. But it gets at something much deeper, which is language. Language is something that is so deeply rooted in a culture. And you've got here a culture in which it is actually more important to know whether the water is flowing or still than whether it's yesterday or tomorrow. What you've got here is two types of time, present moment and all else. Those are your options. Present moment and all else. It's either now or it's not now. And not now may take the form of the not now that's coming in the future, or it may take the form of the not now that's over. But while you're here, yes, of course, we have to go back to our lives and show up on time, and our bosses want us on time, and soccer practice starts on time. And, but while you're here, see what it would be like to live in a world in which there's only two types of time. There's present moment and there's all else. And every thought that you have that comes to your mind about anything other than the present moment, allow yourself simply to recognize it's not now. It's not present moment. And see what that would be like. And then if you want to take it a step deeper, see what it would be like to live a life in which the state of the water was more important than time. And see, see what that would look like. And give yourself that opportunity. Because that's what really shifts and resets who we are. So a third element that I'd love to share is the concept, the spiritual teaching concept of truth. In, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives us a very beautiful teaching which is that tapas of speech, the right speech, dharmic speech, spiritual speech, is that which is truthful, kind, and beneficial. 
It actually has to be all three of those. And this is very, very different from the world that I grew up in, which was truth at all costs. Doesn't matter if it hurts. That was the, that was the evolved West. That was the reaction to what we felt were lies and deception. It was going to be truth at all costs. And a lot of us in the West still have that as a, a belief. Well, and you hear people say, well, I mean, I had to tell her it was the truth. Right? I had to say it. It was the truth. And what I love about this core teaching is being true isn't actually enough. When I was in high school, I was entering my last year of high school, my love of my life, boyfriend, I mean, at the time, I thought we were soulmates, of course, because when you're 16 and in love, of course, you're soulmates. And I mean, it's beautiful. Being 16 and being in love is very, very, very precious and beautiful. But in any case, so in my mind, we were, we were soulmates. And he was a year older and going off to college. And I remember sitting for dinner with my dad one night. And my dad is a divorce attorney. It's what he does. It's what he's done for 40 years as he divorces people. And my dad is a very, very, very wise man and an incredible man. And so I was sitting at dinner with him one night, and he says to me, so what about you and Eric? Eric was this, my soulmate's name. So he said, so tell me about you and Eric. What's, what's going to happen? I mean, he's going off to college in a few weeks. What's going to happen? And I said to my dad, well, we're going to have an open relationship. And my dad said, oh, that's interesting. Tell me about it. And I said, which, by the way, is just like the best parenting line ever. When you've got, you know, a teenage child telling you something that you know isn't going to work. So that's, that's very interesting. Tell me about that. So I said, well, we're going to stay together, of course, because, I mean, we're soulmates. But we're going to date other people because, of course, we're far away. But we're going to tell each other about it. <laughs> and my dad says, let me get this straight. He says, you're going to date other people, then tell each other about it, and stay together forever. And in my truth at all costs, truth is the, the highest, the only, I said, well, of course. And my dad, in, again, just such an incredible moment of parenting hall of fame, says, well, that sounds very interesting. I really look forward to hearing how that works out for you. <laughs> But I share this story because this is, this is the world of truth at all costs. And that's, that's the world that I, I came from. It's the, well, yeah, it's going to hurt, but it's the truth, so it's okay. And what the, the Indian teaching tells us is not everything that's true needs to be said. Our, our speech has a power. In the West, we're very afraid of silence. You sit across a table from someone, and you run out of something to talk about, and there's this palpable tension. And everybody starts thinking, OK, so what can we talk about now? Who's going who's gonna to say something? You know, oh my god, there was this really awkward silence. We're afraid of silence. And so we keep talking. And in India, that's not the case. I've ridden in cars from Rishikesh to Delhi for six hours. 
in a car full of three or four people who, whom I know well, and nobody speaks. Maybe you talk about you want to stop somewhere for a cup of tea or a bathroom break. Or, and there's no awkwardness, and it's just, there's, there's an awareness, awareness of the okayness of silence. And in the awareness of that okayness of silence comes the question of how to use my speech as power. Sound has power. There's an entire science of the power of sound. We have a Veda, an entire scripture, the Psalm Ved, dedicated to the power of sound. Whether I'm chanting mantras, whether I'm singing hymns, whether I'm gossiping, whether I'm whining, whether I'm yelling at someone, in every single case, the sound emanating from my mouth travels in energetic sound waves. And those sound waves have an impact, a very physiological impact on the world around me. There's, there's an entire huge body of research on this. And so speech is seen as a power. It's not just something that fills the space. And so tapas of speech, tapas is sadhana, spiritual practice. So the, the sadhana of speech is that which is true and kind and beneficial. That it's got to actually be all three of those. And that's, that's a really powerful shift, is to ask yourself before you open your mouth, is what I'm about to say not only true, but is it kind, and is it also beneficial to this moment? And what you'll find is there's a lot more si silence. And in that silence, if we're able to not feel awkward, then the silence itself becomes a power. And in that silence is where, I mean, you've come all this way. Not just from your countries to Rishikesh, but from Rishikesh up here. Presumably on some level, you understand that silence is good. So try not to be afraid of it in, in being with people. See what it's like to just sit together with the awareness that I don't actually have to say something and see what happens in that silence. And the last, the last piece that I'll share, I mean, I could do this all night, but I'm just going to share, share one more and then open it up, is a teaching that the world is a family. One of the, the real core It's not so much a mantra as just a, a teaching, a saying from the scriptures is Vasudev Kutumbakam. And it literally means the world is a family. And whether it's our spiritual practice we're looking at, or whether it's how can we be a vehicle to bring about peace and light in the world, well, all of these borders and boundaries of separation prevent us from awakening spiritually, and they prevent us from living together in peace. And so the concept of the world as a family is an incredible, incredible thing for my life and for any way that I might be able to be in service of the world. because. Then there's this concept of, wow, this is my family of different colors, 
different cultures, different languages, different places, different preferences. But there's no longer a sense of us and them. And when we live with this, every aspect of our life changes. What we eat, what we wear, what we buy. Because suddenly, those people who are impacted by the ripples of what you are doing are your own family. There no longer is a them. It's all us. In the Upanishads, we're taught that the divine pervades everything. So it's all us. It's all self. And if that seems a little bit much to begin with, then we begin with just, it's all my family. But this is, how, this is how Indians live. I mean, people call each other at the end of everybody's name gets added by, if it's a man, which means brother, Ben, if it's a woman, which means sister. Everybody is so-and-so Mataji. So their name and then Mataji gets added or so-and-so uncle or so-and-so auntie. They actually use the English for that. It's cute. Um, everybody's name gets, gets done like that because the world is a family. And I learned this. I learned this in the very beginning when I first started learning to wear saris. Because from the beginning, I wanted to wear saris. And I think, you know, people would say, oh, it's so difficult. And I thought, well, you know, India's got about a billion people at that time, little less. But if half a billion people, women, the women of India, can do this every day, it can't be rocket science. I've got to be able to figure it out. And so I started wearing a sari from the beginning, and I wore it poorly. I did my best, but I've never been much of a, a fashion person anyway. When I was wearing pants and shirts or skirts, I was not much of a fashion person. So six meters of fabric was a little bit daunting. But I kept trying, and I kept doing it. And every day I'd go out, and some random woman in the ashram in the street would come up to me and literally stick her hand like into my clothes and fix my, my sari. <laughs> I mean, now you imagine, you're walking down the street, some random woman comes up and literally basically sticks her hand in your underpants. And, or, or here, I mean, now I just do the sari like this, but I used to do it, you know, very neatly, and you'd fold it and pin it, but of course it was never quite right, and so she'd come in and get her hand in my bra, you know. And the first couple times that happened, I felt really violated. I was like, oh my God, you know, excuse me, excuse me, I don't know you. You know, get your hands out of my underwear, I'm okay. But by, by really some, some miracle of God, it just, it was grace. At a very quick moment, what I realized was that these, these old women were not interested in being in my underpants. These old women were not, not violating me. But they were doing for me exactly what they would do for their daughters. If their daughter was walking out of the house with a poorly tied sari, they would never let their daughter out of the house like that. And that these random women were just adopting me left and right. <laughs> and that I was really being given a choice. And the choice was to either feel violated or adopted. And that was my choice. And this, this actually takes us into one more point that I do want to mention, which is the power of thought. Because the, the Indian scriptures are rooted in the concept of you create your reality. As is inside, so is outside. So for me, this was given in the awareness of either I've been violated, at which point I need to be upset, angry, 
I need to contract, or I've been adopted. And it's just, it's a shift in thought. And today, top research institutes of America, and all over the world, but I'm most familiar with the ones in America, are bringing out research on the power of thought. Not just the power of thought to change my body, not just I'm no longer a mind and body separate, but I'm actually body-mind. Actually, that which I think, that which I feel, is speaking to the cells of my immune system. We know that. We didn't know it decades ago, but we've known it for many years. But now they've taken it a step further, which is the power of my mind and thought, not only on my immune system, but on my external world, on the rate at which trees grow, the rate at which flowers blossom, <coughs> on the pH of water. They've done studies of power of thought of changing the pH of a body of water. And everything. And again, these are, these are not yoga studios doing it. These are not institutes with names like New Age Institute of you know, Thought Research. These are places like Princeton that are conducting this research. So your thoughts are things. Your thoughts are things, and they are things that build your world. They are the bricks of your home. They have energy. We have machines that can actually do a brain scan without even touching your head. Thoughts are things. Watch them. Use them to build the home that you want to live in. And it's not easy. It's simple, but not easy. But this is the power of meditation. It's the power of mantra, all of which you'll be getting this week, I'm sure. It's the power of bringing the mind into our awareness, of mindfulness. And that's not something that we do just so that we feel peaceful. It's something we do because it's the only way to build the world that we want to live in, both personally as well as externally.